Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at RIA taking a look at a German Gewehr 98 World War I era sniper rifle. Now there's a tremendous amount of variation in German World War I sniper rifles, so we're going to take a look at this as an example of the type and see what we can discern about it. Now to give you a little background on these, Germany was by far the most successful country in World War I as far as establishing and maintaining a system of sniper rifles. Uh, they took to it very early. Um, December of 1914, the Prussians had already realized that scoped rifles were going to be a thing. Um, they had not been in the military up to that point. They had been used for things like actually te like accuracy testing guns at the factory sometimes, but not for field issue. They recognized this was going to be a, an, a thing. So the first thing that they did was go out and see what they could basically scrounge up from the population. Now, of course, everybody, all the countries involved in Europe, did this with lots of other equipment. Horses, carts, that sort of thing. You can just go around to the peasantry and basically confiscate the stuff that you need. But the Germans couldn't quite do that with scoped civilian hunting rifles because the people who owned those rifles weren't just peasants. They were tended to be people of some means and importance. So they asked politely uh, if out of patriotic uh, fervor, people would be willing to donate their scoped rifles. <laughs> and uh, to quote one of the German books that I was reading on this subject, uh, they were met with a lot of replies that patriotically said no. But they did get some guns. Turns out, as it, as it turned out, like uh, commercial civilian hunting rifles weren't all that good for trench warfare. Double set triggers didn't work very reliably in the mud in the trenches. Uh, they tended to have short barrels for being hunting rifles, not accurate, you know, not target shooting rifles. So they actually tended to be a bit less accurate than people wanted. They tended to have a lot of muzzle blast. They were often set up for cartridges that weren't the standard German military round. A lot of them set up for uh, pattern 88, 8 millimeter Mauser ammunition. Anyway, a lot of problems. Um, it was a temporary solution. And Prussia, as well as Bavaria, started ordering scoped rifles from companies in Germany. Um, in fact, by the spring of 1915, Prussia had figured that they're going to need at least 18,000 sniper rifles, and they had put 15,000 of them on order. That is a huge number compared to what the British or the French were doing. And frankly, the Russians never even had a scoped rifle by the end of the war. The Germans were on this. Uh, now, there would be a number of interesting sort of different patterns of rifle that they would use. First off, there were at least 10 different manufacturers of scopes that were used. Germany was a leader in optical manufacturing worldwide at this point, and they had lots of people who could make scopes, and they were perfectly happy to buy from all of them. Uh, the Prussians tended to favor a three power scope, figuring they'd rather have a wider field of view than higher magnification. Uh, they had uh, range, range uh, uh, dials on the scopes that went from 100 meters out to 1,000 meters in 100 meter increments, typically speaking. They typically tended to mount their scopes offset to the left side of the rifle to allow them to be used with stripper clips. The Bavarians, on the other hand, kind of had a different set of, of ideal uh, you know, standards for a sniper rifle. The Bavarians tended to go with uh, BDCs that were set for 2, 4, and 600 meters. They had typically four power scopes instead of three, opting for more magnification and reduced field of view. They tended to mount their scopes directly centerline over the barrel, figuring that this was this made for better shooting, and they were willing to accept the compromise of not being able to use the stripper clips, because frankly, for one thing, if you're if it's a sniper rifle, do you really need to be speed loading it? Probably not. If you do, well, you can take the scope off. And if you're gonna be doing rapid fire shooting and going through a lot of ammo, you're probably better off taking the scope off and using the irons anyway. These are all detachable scopes. Uh, now there are a variety of different scope mounts that were used. They were typically uh, specific to the make of a particular scope and its mounting rings. So you, the, the true experts in this field can identify what scope should go on a rifle based on the exact pattern of the bases that are on the rifle. Um, that, is, that is something that requires quite a lot of study. So with all of that in mind, let's go ahead and take a closer look at this particular example and see what we can determine about it. 
Now, I just got done describing the configurations that were preferred by the Prussians versus the Bavarians. Uh, and here I am immediately going to contradict it because what we have here is a Prussian type uh, 1 to 10 uh, ranging BDC and a center mounted scope. And the fact of the matter is, as the course of the war went on, these uh, tendencies tended to blur, these preferences tended to blur. And you saw variations, uh, you know, three power Bavarians, four power Prussians, center mounted Prussians, all that sort of stuff. These, these were not hard and fast rules, they were just uh, preferences, and especially um, early preferences. The rifle here still has its receiver in the white, as it should. Um, it is a Gewehr 98. Uh, the rifle is all matching. I won't go through pointing out all the serial numbers because being a Gewehr 98, it's got a ton of them. Uh, but it is an all matching rifle, 9885HH. Uh, this is a 1917 Danzig Arsenal production, although you can't see those markings because they are underneath the front scope base. The scope here is OG production. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. I don't know how that's supposed to be said in German. Uh, but that is one of the optics makers that provided scopes. Um, and we have it marked here, Gewehr number 8702. That was the original rifle that it was paired with. Um, these scopes were issued with carrying cases and you wouldn't, you wouldn't run around with the scope mounted on the rifle if you weren't actually using it because these scopes are relatively fragile, um, especially by today's standards. And so if you weren't using it, you put it in its protective case to keep it safe, keep it clean, and so on. Uh, and to prevent mix-up, it's uh, important to have your scopes numbered. That way you don't put on your buddy's scope and realize your zero is totally off. Now, unfortunately, someone has gone and lined out that number and replaced it. And that is a machine engraved replacement number. And that is definitely not an original engraving. So this scope itself is a legit, correct, original World War I German sniper rifle scope. But those markings, that 8001, is not original or correct. On the other side of the scope here, by the way, we have the scope serial number, uh, name it's a Luxor, and it's a three power scope. We'll take a closer look by removing the scope. I can lift this lever vertical and then the scope lifts out, there we go, lifts out of its rear mount and then its front mount. Now if we look at the rings, you can see we have 8702 uh, on the front ring. So this is, the ring is numbered to the rifle as well. We also have it on the back ring. This back ring is windage adjustable right here, so that's how you can set your zero. Notice that on the inside of the front ring we have uh, one three. That is an assembly number which is typically found on authentic uh, original rings. Now we can take a look at the mounts. This is the most common style of mount where you've got the front uh, set directly over the chamber and the rear offset. Um, the offset is there so that you can still use the iron sights of the rifle. Note that we have a nice big tunnel cut out in the front ring uh, so that you can look down the iron sights there. The front mount here is original. Um, a couple things to take note of. Uh, it is obviously 100 years old and the surface finish has, has wear to it. It's got little pits in it. Um, you know, it, it's obviously, it has not been polished recently and it shows signs of its age. Also, these two dashes are actually the mounting screws that hold it in place. The German gunsmiths that put these things together uh, did some things that we would consider pretty ridiculously high quality today. And that includes actually lining up all the screws at proper tension so that their slots are parallel like this. Um, and then in this case, staking them in place. The screw heads are ground perfectly flush. You can't feel, I mean, this screw is almost completely invisible. This one you can see, uh, but you can't feel it. That is a correct original front sight mount, or front scope mount. Now compare that to the rear mount here, and you'll see that this surface uh, it has been polished, and it doesn't have any of the aging signs that we saw on the rear one. Notice also that our screws are not quite aligned, and the, the side screw here, let's see if I can get, you can, yeah, you can see it there, it is not quite flush with the surface of the mount, and you can easily feel that. These two are pretty close, this one's not so much. Now, like so many things these days, there are reproduction scope bases made for these rifles, and this uh, appears to me to be a reproduction rear scope base. Now, why would it have an original front and a reproduction rear? That's a very interesting question. 
my hypothesis for this is based on the fact that uh, the scope manufacturers and rings were proprietary to their own mounts. And this front mount, upon consultation with some experts, is actually a mount for a three-power Voigtlander scope, not the brand that we actually see on this rifle. So I suspect that this, uh, this, this rifle came back from the war without a scope, or the scope was lost at some point. And at some point, a collector looking to complete the rifle was able to find this OEG OG, OEG, uh, scope, but it wouldn't fit on the rear mount. It would fit the front, but it wouldn't line up with the rear. And so I suspect, can't prove, but suspect that they then replaced the rear mount with a reproduction mount that would fit the scope that they had available. Um, thus, being able to mount the scope and have what appears to be an authentic sniper. And it almost is an authentic sniper. Like, it's really a shame that they did that because the rifle itself is absolutely a legit original sniper rifle. It just has the wrong mount and the wrong pattern of scope on it. A real sniper scope, but not the right sniper scope for this particular rifle. I should also point out while we're here that uh, the bolt handles were, of course, bent uh, at the factory when these uh, scope conversions were done. Uh, and uh, the sniper conversions were done at the rifle factories. Now, I believe it was Omberg also flattened the bottom of the bolt handle, as well as cutting this little dish in the stock to give you a little more, a little more area to get your hand under the bolt handle. Um, by the way, you bend the bolt handle like this so that it doesn't hit the scope when you cycle the rifle. Um, the other factories, and this is a Dunzig production rifle, uh, left the bolt handle uh, round. So that's, that's correct. I will also point out that under the front band is a nicely concealed glued duffel cut, um, which further supports the, uh, the idea that this was an original sniper rifle that came back um, in a, a duffel bag or suitcase of some sort. The Germans were quick to adopt scoped sniper rifles, and they successfully managed to build up a stockpile and maintain them in inventory as well. Uh, by the middle of 1916, every German infantry, uh, infantry and Jaeger company, company being 100, 120 men, uh, had three scoped rifles. Now what's interesting is the Germans didn't set up any sort of authoritative sniper doctrine. Um, in fact, in the case of Prussian units, they just shipped rifles to the, to the units and didn't tell them anything about how to maintain it, how to zero it, how to use it, just showed up, here they were. Um, the Bavarians apparently, uh, were a little better suited. They, um, they tended to have more uh, experience with scoped hunting rifles in civilian life and had a better handle on how to take care of them and best exploit them. But where the Germans did do things like develop very specific tactics for use with the light machine guns and hand grenades, they didn't do it with scoped rifles. The British, for example, did. The British had a pretty darn serious sniper training program and sniper doctrine and manuals. And it's an interesting dichotomy between, uh, you know, it, it's all trade-offs. The Germans had a ton of the rifles, but no explicit doctrine. The British didn't have as many rifles, but they were, uh, they were better exploited their use uh, through superior training. So um, all in all, German sniper rifles are the most common of World War I. The, most of them, were mo there were more of them made than any other countries. And so they can be more common to find, but it's still very difficult to find a totally 100% correct original example. It's been 100 years, and um, especially when you see things like, you know, rifle comes back without a scope. So how do you find a scope that fits the particular set of mounts that that rifle is set up with? People can't find the right mounts, and so they make changes to the rifle to make things fit. So uh, hopefully you guys learned something in this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.